All right. So I am Julie Barrett, founder of Conservative Ladies of America and Conservative Ladies of Washington. You are joining us for Educate Yourself on Education. This is a parent's discussion on how to prepare for the school year. We want to give you guys all of the information about what's happening in our government schools, also many of our private schools as well. So encourage you to grab um, a piece of paper and a pencil or a writing utensil and uh, take notes. There'll be a lot of information here. We will be sending you a follow-up email after this event tomorrow um, with a lot of links and additional information. So if you miss anything tonight, don't worry about it. You're going to get um, something in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, so the topics that we're going to be talking about tonight are SEL, which is social emotional learning, which is the operating system for the indoctrination that we have going on in schools today. Then we'll hit on the CDC's whole school, whole community, whole child model. We're going to actually switch up uh, and do gender ideology and queer theory after that. And then we will follow that with critical theory. And in case you are not liking what you're hearing tonight and want to consider homeschool, we're going to be talking about homeschool, some encouraging information about homeschool, some tools and resources if you decide that's the route that you want to go. So that's our agenda for tonight, um, our presenters. Uh, again, I'm Julie Barrett. I'll be talking about social emotional learning. I'll be followed by Joy Jerswold, who is the chapter chair for Moms for Liberty in Kitsap County, Washington. And she will be talking about the CDC's WCC, WSCC. Thank you, Joy. I see you mouthing that to me. Um, and then we will have Alex Krastowski, who is the Washington State Chapter Leader for Gays Against Groomers, and she will be talking about queer theory and gender ideology. Followed by Jeannie Magdua, who is one of our Conservative Ladies of Washington Legislative Action Team leaders. She will be talking about critical theory, the roots of critical race theory and how it started, how it got here. Um, and then we will finish up with Leslie Williams, um, on consider homeschooling. And Leslie is also one of our legislative action team leaders. She's also with the Independent American Patriots Party. And she's a mom of a whole gaggle of children who homeschools. And she's got a ton of great information to share with you tonight. All right, so let's dig into social emotional learning. SEL is the operating system for all of the indoctrination in education today. SEL is in all 50 states. Yes, even the red states, which a lot of people are surprised at. I am here in Florida, and I know there's a lot of um, headlines about Florida um, banned SEL, and that's that's not true. Um, it is here in Florida as well, and every other state. Um, SEL seeks to transform a child's perception of their identity using what's called the intersectionality framework. We'll hit on that in a moment. SEL shapes a child's decision-making around those identities. SEL allows the government schools to data mine your child and develop a social credit system. SEL is designed to teach children that America is systemically inequitable. So these are the um, bullet points that I'm going to hit on tonight. And um, then you're going to hear the gals that are speaking after me are going to get into these in a little bit more detail. So what is SEL? Um, just kind of uh, an aside from what you're seeing here on the screen, SEL, when it started, was, was really used in special education classrooms with children who might have been on the autism spectrum or had other special needs or learning challenges. And so you might have had a child in a special ed class where they got social skills and they called it SEL. Um, and these were to teach children things like eye contact and, and just general social skills. And it was actually a good thing. Um, and it was very necessary for these kids. And they have mainstreamed it. And it's taken on a very leftist um, uh, agenda here. Um, and it, it is not what it originally was. So social emotional learning is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities. 
manage emotions and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others. You've probably seen that word empathy in a lot of the materials, establish and maintain supportive relationships and make responsible and caring decisions. SEL advances educational equity and excellence through authentic school, family, community partnerships. Another one you want to look at is those partnerships to establish learning environments and experiences that feature trusting and collaborative relationships, rigorous and meaningful curriculum and instruction and ongoing evaluation. SEL can help address various forms of inequity and empower young people and adults to co-create thriving schools and contribute to safe, healthy, and just communities. So you can see that they're wrapping these, you know, justice and equity uh, buzzwords into their definition. And this comes straight from uh, the CASEL website, um, which is uh, the um, collaborative academic or social and emotional learning. It's the largest provider of SEL um, information in the country. Uh, if you're not familiar with James Lindsay, highly recommend following him. I'll put a link out um, about, on his links to follow him in the email that you'll receive tomorrow. Um, but he says social emotional learning is the primary vehicle for conscientization. Say that 10 times fast. It is the key operating tool to achieve an agenda to install a new system in the world. Um, and this is not... Um, conspiracy theory. This is actually what they're doing uh, to our children. Um, and one of the things that um, you will hear constantly through the curriculum for SEL, you're probably hearing it through your schools, is um, a lot of these buzzwords, inclusion, belonging, empathy, safety, justice, equity, um, all of these words are, they want to take advantage of a child's kindness. And, and one of the things that we need to think about as parents and grandparents is, why are our kids buying into this so easily? Well, it's because we have, right? I mean, you might find yourself calling someone by their quote, preferred pronouns because you don't want to be unkind to them, or you might be bending the truth um, because you don't want to be considered unkind or you don't want to be called a name. And so um, our, our generation has um, taken this on. And so our children are just really following suit. This uh, graphic is from courageisahabit.org. Highly recommend following them as well. Um, and here is the mission for Castle. Um, they've been a leader um, since introducing this term more than two decades ago. So they were the people that um, were doing it in the special ed classrooms. And I think it's safe to say that, that this always had an agenda of being mainstreamed. Um, and so you can go to castle.org to their website um, and get buried down a number of different um, rabbit holes there with information. And uh, I highly recommend that that you do that um, at least from time to time and just kind of see what they're all about and what they're pushing into the schools. It's, it's very enlightening. Um, they want to do a systemic implementation. So they want this to be in all parts of the academic, um, all part of the ed educational process. So that's why you see it being put into a kid's PE class. You see it in their math. Um, the state of Washington has this, but you've probably heard of Seattle Public Schools had this whole thing with math being racist. Um, and so you'll see story problems that talk about, um, you know, equity and inclusion and, and the LGBTQ stuff. So they're, they're putting this in every aspect of education. And, and that's one of the reasons why our children are not doing well um, on their test scores. Uh, so this is the castle wheel. You've maybe seen this before um, with SEL at the center. One of the things that I think is most um, alarming about this wheel is where are the families? Where are the homes? As you can see there on that outer ring there. Um, and so that kind of shows you where the importance of families and parents is um, in this whole framework. Uh, so in, at the center, you've got the five core social and emotional competencies. Um, you've got self-awareness, self -awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And all of these 
these aspects are not for free thinking. They are uh, indoctrinating these kids to have social awareness that aligns with the leftist agenda. All of these things are designed to uh, go along with the leftist agenda. Um, this is um, from a uh, SEL blog. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. Um, research demonstrated that integrating SEL instruction into the academic day is critical for positive and continuous growth in both academic learning and SEL. So they want parents um, and politicians, policymakers to believe that there's research that substantiates the necessity of SEL being put into um, the, the, the whole system of education and, and that this actually helps in their academic learning. But as you can see, and this is from, um, this is from Washington State Schools, um, it's so critical to academic performance. And yet here with the report card, um, and this was from last year, spring of 22, only 50% of kids were meeting ELA standards, uh, not even 40% meeting math standards, um, and just slightly over 40% meeting the science standards. So they're, they're calling it critical, but since they've introduced this, kids are actually um, falling very far behind in academics. And with, you know, the, the COVID lockdowns that we had for a couple of years, we know that um, that set kids back even further. And then with, through these last couple of years, we've seen them really ramping up the SEL. So they're ramping up the SEL and it's just the, the scores are continued to fall down. Um, and an example of this is in all 50 states. This is from Montana's website, um, Montana Office of Public Instruction. Um, you can go to every state and find out what is going on in your state, um, what kind of policies they've enacted around social emotional learning. You will, we're going to get you a link for that so you know exactly where to go. Um, but I highly recommend that for your, you pull up your state and figure out what um, policies they have put in place and what kind of curriculum they're putting into schools, um, because a lot of parents um, in red states are often surprised to see that, oh, yep, yeah, it's here too. So, um, and this is uh, what Florida is doing. Um, and so they call it um, the resiliency toolkit. Um, and th that's another word for SEL. So they, they will, they will rename it. They will rebrand it, um, because SEL has gotten a bad rap and a lot of people, a lot of parents do not like, um, SEL. And so what they're doing to work around that is just renaming it and rebranding it. Um, but it is the same stuff. The same providers are, um, providing the resources, the curriculum. So you want to, you want to dig beneath the surface. And anytime you see these, these fancy words, um, you know, things like resiliency, um, character skills, personal responsibility, um, all of these things are, are kind of those, those red flags. All right, and sorry, this is not a clickable link. I thought it would be, um, but that will be in your um, email that you get tomorrow with all of the links. All right, so this is um, intersectionality and they will have kids of all ages identify their intersectionality. Um, and they, there's several different renditions of this. Um, and these are just two of them. I, in my, one of my children was in, uh, I, I think it was eighth grade health class where they were doing a uh, lesson with the wheel of power and privilege and the the teacher made it a game um and so she would had she had all the kids line up in a straight line and they were to take steps forward or backward based on their um power or privilege so for instance if you were white you would take a step forward if you were poor, you would take a step backward. And so all of these kids in the line are being physically identified as who are the oppressors and who are the victims. Um, this is 
Obviously, this is very, very detrimental to children. It's very divisive for kids. Um, and they are, like I said, they are doing this even in the younger grades. Um, and it does, it, it's one of the reasons I believe that we're seeing kids who want to identify as, you know, part of the LGBT community because they see those kids being favored. And so sure, I'll be non-binary this week. And, and that might win me some favor with my teacher. If I say I'm part of the, the LGBTQIA plus whatever community. Uh, this is just one example of uh, an identity lesson. Um, and this is the suggested grade level on this is four to eight. And if you recall um, at the opening, I said SEL shapes a child's decision making around their identities. Um, and so in this lesson, they want students to reflect on how their identities can shape the way they experience the world and how painful it cannot, it can be not to feel affirmed to share one's full self. So they're really, you know, needing, teaching kids to need outside affirmation of, you know, whatever their chosen identity is. Um, students will reflect on the impact of behaviors that can cause other students to feel unsafe sharing their whole selves. Um, and so you see this in, in various ways, you know, people being offended because maybe another kid doesn't believe the same things. Um, and so it's very harmful because they really are teaching children to, to be victims and not to take personal responsibility. Uh, this is a big one. And I know Joy and, um, and Alex are both going to talk about this one more. This is a huge one. They're data mining your children uh, with, all you know, your public school probably has an app, a parent app. Um, that that you use, they're getting data from that. They're using, they're doing surveys on the on the kids in schools. They're data mining your kids through surveys. They are um, these these surveys allow a psychological profiling of your children, um, and the data is used to drive more CRT and transgender policies in the school. So they'll take the, the information that they get and say that there's a need for more of this in the schools. So we're gonna give you lots of information on how you can opt your kids out of this. Um, and data, they need to do the data mining to continue funding SEL. So when they go back to their state legislature to increase funding or on a federal level to increase funding, they use this data that they've collected from your children uh, to get um, to get more funding. And so this is a um, this self-fulfilling prophecy of this this cycle of how the data mining works, you know, they're in number one, they're in class collecting the student data, that data is interpreted through an equity lens, then the results are stored and evaluated. And then the results require changes to school culture. So they're using those results to manipulate what's going on in the schools. And then students are radicalized by the new culture. Um, and the cycle just continues to repeat. And again, this is also from Courage is a Habit, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Highly recommend you go to their website and bookmark it. All right. So here's your call to action. Um, we're going to give you a few different calls to action for starting this school year, but opt out. Um, the system breaks when students overwhelmingly opt out of surveys. Um, when they don't have the data, they can't continue to push this garbage indoctrination into the schools. They can't fund it if they don't have the data to support it. So if we could get, you know, just masses of students opting out and they don't have enough data, then they cannot push this um, into the schools. Um, and so that is it for the SEL. As you probably can tell, there is a ton of information on SEL. It could be a whole two hour topic in and of itself, um, but we just wanted to touch on it, touch on each of these topics tonight to give you some broad information. And then you can take the links that we give you tomorrow and go down any rabbit trails that you want. Um, and so I'm going to pass off to Joy, and she's going to cover the CDC whole school model for you. Joy, take it away. I'm trying to unmute. Aha, there we go. I was trying to unmute. Thank you very much, Julie. Such great information. Um, we are going to jump right into the whole school or WSCC model. Um, it stands for whole school 
Whole Community, Whole, Whole Child, and it is brought to you by the CDC. Um, hopefully just that knowledge helps you understand that you sh should probably be asking a lot of questions. And just a couple of things as we get started. Um, it's going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose tonight because you are. It, this information is coming at us fast and furious. And as Julie mentioned, the names change a lot. So we're going to talk about that today because there's a reason for that. They want to confuse you. They want to gaslight you. And they want you to just give up and just go, oh, it's too hard. So the common names for the madness, just so you know, that's what I like to call it. And I was able to put the question out to several of our chapter chairs in our chapter chair group and get some ideas for you for what this is called all over the United States. As you see in um, New York, it has a couple different names um, that it goes by, but connected seems to be their, their you know, thread that they run. Community schools is another um, uh, name that you're gonna hear it called. In Minnesota, they call it safe and supportive schools. Now in Oklahoma and many other states, they are not even trying to hide it. They're tying it directly to social emotional learning and the MTSS system or the multi-tiered system of supports. And I'll get into that in a few minutes about how the data is mined and used for that. And then straight from the CDC, they call this mental health care, which is extremely disingenuous. Um, it's supposed to be home away from home and for services for under-resourced homes and families. And that's what they're trying to do. That's how they're selling it to you. So why is the CDC doing this? The education, public health, and school health sectors have each called for greater alignment that includes integration and collaboration between education leaders and the health sectors to improve each child's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development. Are you noticing some common language here? Social and emotional has a comma in between this on the CDC, but they're really talking about social emotional learning. Public health and education serve the same children, often in the same settings. So the WSCC model focuses on the child to align the common goals of both sectors, to put into action a whole child approach to education. Now you'll notice this is not a clickable link, but it is one of the links included in information that Julie will be sending out later this evening. This comes directly from the CDC website because it's important to us, trust us because we're taking it directly from the sites, but always verify because it's important for you to know that. So what is the WSCC model? What does it look like? And please understand that I'm doing a very, um, precursory look at this today. My hope is, is that, that you will do a deep dive. The very best way to learn these systems and these um, programs is go to the websites, spend several evenings after the kids go to bed or while they're at school during the day, click on every hyperlink and look at every layer of these programs. The whole school, whole community, whole child model is the CDC's framework for addressing health in schools. The WSCC model is student-centered and it emphasizes, notice what they say here, the role of the community in supporting school, the connections between health and academic achievement, and the importance of evidence-based school policies and practices. There again, they use language to make you believe that the data already exists to back up what they're doing. None of these pieces of data that they use are reliable um, work. So keep that in mind. Let's look at the 10 components. Physical education and physical activity, nutrition, environment, and services, health education, social and emotional climate, physical environment, health services, counseling, psychological, and social services, employee wellness, that is a part of this, community involvement, and very last, the 10th component, is family engagement. And as you read through the website, you will find that they actually use the phrase that families are invited to participate. That's usually code for, we don't really want you involved. We want you to feel like we tried to make you feel involved. So if we go to the next slide, one of these, um, the second steps wheel on the right as you're looking at the screen looks very similar 
to the castle wheel that Julie was showing you because they are very similar. In second step social emotional learning curriculum, the families were moved out to the second to last ring and they put communities on the outside. If you look at the left wheel, which is the CDC's model for um, the WSCC, you'll notice that families are moved clear out to the very last. And that is also shown in their 10th principle or their 10th part of the model that they have for families. They do not want family involvement the way that you should be involved in your kids' education. So let's go to the next slide and look at their role, what they define as the role of the family, specifically the underlying part. When schools engage families in meaningful ways to improve student health and learning, families can support and reinforce healthy behaviors in multiple settings. It sounds good until this last part. In home, in school, in out of school programs, and in the community. Hopefully, you're starting to have some real questions. The first one being, what the heck does the CDC want to know about what's going on in my home and why is the school being involved? So let's look at some of the questions you should be asking. On the next slide, please. Why are medical clinics going to be in school? Because that's what they're going to do. And I'll give, I'll show you some pictures from the virtual tour of what a WSCC compliant school looks like in a moment. Who decides the support and the reinforcements? I'll get into that a little deeper in a moment with the data mining. Who decides what is healthy? Why are they concerned about my child's or my children's in-home, out of school and in school activities? What medical services will be provided? Will my permission be required? And how are they deciding what services are needed? Well, let's get into that. <laughs> so if you want to, you can take a moment and scan this QR code. It's direct from the CDC website. It will take you to what you see in the screenshot on the left, which is the virtual tour. And it's broken down by grade level. It will walk you through what compliant classrooms and compliant schools look like. This link is included in the information that we'll be sending out later this evening, so you can take some time to look through that. Next slide, please. So the data mining. This is a huge part of what they do. There is a direct connection between those panorama surveys that your kids are taking, which the survey industry for social emotional learning is a billions of dollars industry in the United States right now. Um, there are other companies, but most of the school districts are, are going with Panorama uh, education. They are used by your school districts for SEL and to get information for community schools. They use the data that they mine on your child and not just your child, but on your family to decide the services that your child needs through the in-school clinics, whether you want them or not. This is what they call the wraparound portion of the Panorama system. This is where the MTSS, the multi-tier um, system of services come in. And what they do is they use this data that's gathered both by the surveys and teachers are taking data and filling out surveys on your children almost on a daily basis in the classroom. And they will take that data and then decide what services your child needs. This is going to greatly impact our children who are special needs that are already struggling to get the services that they deserve and qualify for. So this is something that our special needs families need to be very aware of, but all families need to be aware of. One of the CDC's ways that they are getting information is through the YRBS, and that is a youth um, health survey that is, has been given in the U.S. since 1991. It is highly sexual, very invasive, asks about political uh, questions, sexual questions, all sorts of things that have to do with home life. One thing that you need to be aware of is they've added an extra S to YRBS. They call it the Healthy Student Survey, but now it's called the Healthy Student Survey Surveillance or Secret Surveillance. I've seen it called both, depending on where you look. They're not even hiding that they are surveilling your family and your children now. Um, 
this is extremely important to know and why you need to opt out of the surveys is right now, the AG of Missouri has several school districts and Panorama Survey under investigation because they are breaking federal law and asking these questions. Pupil Privacy Rights, the, pup the Pupil Privacy um, Act, Rights Act, states very clearly that you cannot ask these questions without explicit written approval and permission from parents. So the harder we push back, like Julie said, it breaks, the system breaks, everything stops when we say no. So make that a priority for you and your family this year. Um, as we go through, we're just gonna click through the next few slides kind of quickly because I wanna make sure we get to everything. Um, we talked about whose values, whose beliefs, whose lifestyles. Obviously, they're going to lean on the agendas, values, beliefs, and lifestyles. And now we've got some snapshots of what the virtual tour looks like. Um, so you can see on the left, for example, um, where the arrow is pointing up, they're going to have vision, nurse practitioners, doctors, um, sexual health, um, psychology, counseling, all of these different services will be in the school. Here's the catch. They do not need your permission, especially here in Washington and other states like California and a few others that have very low ages of consent. They'll hide behind the sexual health and that's what they'll say that they have for a reason to do this. The truth is not everybody that will come in contact with your children are actually li licensed practitioners. Some of the counselors we have found are given a counselor or a social worker title simply at the district level. They have no education to back that up and therefore should not be put in those positions where they're having that kind of conversation with your children. That is your job. If they suspect something is wrong, they need to let you know. And then you can help work with your child and your own care providers. Next slide, please. One of the big things you're going to notice as we go through the next couple of slides, in order to be a WSCC compliant school, posters and marketing are a huge part of this. And as you take the virtual tour, even here in the principal's office on the right, the green squad, that's the environmental um, piece that they've been trying to push on us. There's a lot of different parts of this. Um, they will also push for vaccines and have you had your HPV and all these other things. What if you and mom or dad have already decided with your doctor, that's not what you're doing. Kids are pleasers and especially kids on the spectrum and special needs kids. They want to say yes because this teacher or this counselor or this nurse practitioner are in a place of authority to them. So we need to have good conversations with our kids too. You ready to keep clicking? My awesome uh, vice chair is my official tech person here tonight, <laughs> most <Ooh>. days. <laughs> Again, these are just examples I wanted you to see. The safe space, another environment, environmental poster. Um, are you puzzled about life? There's more of that, that leading question to get kids thinking that they're confused or that they need to be a certain way when they just need to be kids. So what are they gonna do to get you to be involved in this? They are going to tell you, not you, what your health services should look like across the, fam the, the framework. They are going to tell you what your nutrition should look like. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have a child with diabetes that I'm already treating with my family doctor, I don't want anybody messing with that because that could be a life or death situation. And if you aren't aware of what they've done at school, how can you accurately answer those questions with a healthcare provider or God forbid in an emergency situation when EMS asks you questions, you won't know. And it could literally mean the life of your child. They're also gonna tell you, this is the part everyone should be very upset about, um, what's gonna be happening in out of school time. That's a little scary. I hope all of you are going, whoa. <laughs> and they are also going to be telling you about physical, uh, physical education and physical activity, which is important. All of these things are important, but it's who is driving this car that matters. And it should be parents, not the schools and not the government. The last thing that they are going to make sure that they have a part in is making you feel guilty. So this all sounds really good. 
until you do your research and you see the overreach yourself, go to the site and spend the time. You need to parent up. You need to be the person that drives this. It sounds good until you realize how much parents will not be part of the equation. It sounds great until you literally have the government and the schools in every aspect of your life and in your private life and not just health, but they're gonna start being pushier about politics and a whole bunch of other things. And you'll realize that it is they, not you, who want to make the decisions about your children. So here's our call to action. How do you protect your children or your child? Number one, you need to make it a priority to try to pull your children from public education. I find no joy in saying that. I'm a former high school teacher for public ed. My parents are both retired teachers. When I started my journey with Moms for Liberty, I got a little defensive when people said, pull your kids out of public school. We need to fix public schools so that we have something to gift to the future and to further generations past us. But we also need to make sure that our children are safe. And right now, public education is not that space. You need to opt out of all data mining, all of it. No questionnaires, no surveys, no anything. And the last part of that on the last slide, and I say this very seriously, you can no longer consider public school employees safe adults, trusted adults for your children. There are lots of great teachers out there. We work with them all the time. If a student is overheard sharing with that good teacher by another teacher or a counselor or an administrator, they could take over and go report this and start this whole process and it could mean you losing custody of your child. You need to have tough, real conversations with your kids. You need to tell them that they don't talk about private things, family things, health things. All of that belongs at home and with your doctor, their counselor, your professionals. And it's difficult, but it is an absolute necessity for our kids now in order to protect them. One other little thing before I turn it over to Alex is one of the ways that they're going to make sure that they get money for this is whether you have Apple Health, which is what we call our state health care here in Washington, or not, they will sign your child up for whatever services they deem that your child needs and then bill Medicaid through the state to get reimbursed for that service. And I know that um, Alex, I'm hoping will mention this evening that at least here in Washington, you can go and check online to see if your child is enrolled. So at least you would know that and know if the school overstepped. So please be aware of that. Don't assume that they won't forge signatures. Don't assume that they won't sign your child up. It's extremely important. So thank you. I appreciate this chance to share this with you. And I know it's a lot. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Joy. That was awesome. So much information. And again, that is a CDC model. So it's it's on a federal level um, and coming to every state. Uh, without further ado, I want to kick over to Alex, who's going to talk about uh, the gender theory, queer theory. Um, Alex, again, is the Washington chapter leader for Gays Against Groomers. And as you can see, she is working while working. she's presenting. So go ahead, Alex, take it away. All right, so bear with me, everybody. Uh, I apologize. I was not supposed to be working this late, but here we are. Um, so everything that Julie and Joy just went over is absolutely critical for you to know. Um, so to start off, I'm going to talk about the origins of queer theory and gender theory, and I'm going to give you three basic names. So the first one, which I think most people should know, is Alfred uh, Kinsey, and he is credited with the basically the evolution of what is modern day sex ed. Uh, on that note, si uh, opt your kids out of every possible sex ed at your school. As awkward as it is, do it yourself or <clears throat> have your pediatrician do it for them. So he is kind of the man behind modern day sex ed. He was an abuser. Uh, he is a terrible person. Uh, a lot of his studies were proven to be uh, 
false, uh, bad data. He's been widely discredited, and yet he is. We are still using his model uh, for most sex ed in the country. The second name I'm going to give you is John Money, and he is credited with essentially what has evolved into modern day gender theory. So. Uh, his most famous experiment was the twin experiment, where there were twin boys. One had a botched circumcision, circumcision and he advised uh, those children's parents to raise the boy as a girl. Um, and he, they did so at his behest. And then they brought their children to him for years on end um, as basically a part of the, an experiment where he was trying to prove his theory that gender is completely separate from sex and that you can, can given the right social conditioning uh someone can be a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy uh if this sounds familiar it should uh to say that that experiment was a catastrophic failure uh would be a drastic understatement uh both both boys in adulthood uh ended up dying one from suicide um later in life the boy who was living as though he were a girl or thought he was one uh, was finally told the truth and it said everything clicked for him because he had never felt like a girl. It had been, it was a, it was a complete disaster across the board. Um, just horrendous, horrendous things. Uh, he had the boys engage in sex acts with each other or simulated sex acts. He took partially nude and fully nude photos of the twins in their sessions. Uh, he was a pedophile and a pedophile symp sympathizer. Um, same thing with Alfred Kinsey, actually. Um, so that's what you should know about the origins of gender theory. And while this third name is not the originator of the term queer theory, she is one of the most prolific writers that brought it into the forefront. Her name was Judith Butler. Uh, you can look up her, her works today. Uh, they are incredibly insightful if you want to understand what what the people behind this movement think and feel read her read her books judith butler uh basically describes queer theory as the dismantling of all social institutions that have to do with sex and gender uh and heteronormativity the entire concept of queer theory is to basically level everything that is considered a norm in society and rebuild it into this brand new world so to speak. So that's those are the three names that you should know if you want to understand where this all came from. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So now I'm going to move into what, how are you, how is this going to present itself in the classroom? Uh, the vehicle for queer theory and gender theory is going to be through social emotional learning um, and sex ed. Those are the, those are the major ways that this is presented to children in school outside of teachers who are activists that just talk to your kids. Um, so those are the main functions. So like for, for instance, in Washington state, many schools have dedicated, dedicated days where they have basically what would be considered independent study. And it is a social emotional learning class. And they will sit children down and they will basically talk about all of this gar garbage to them as dedicated class time. And then additionally, in all of their other classes, English, math, science, all of them, these types of subjects are interwoven into the curriculum by design. So they cannot avoid it. Just because you sign them out of whatever the social emotional learning class is for that, you know, say, I don't want them in this Monday or this Tuesday class. Okay, well, that's not going to do it because it's in everything. So just so you know that. That's how it's going to be presented to them. It's going to be interwoven into their math word problems. It's going to be talked about uh, in, their, in their social studies classroom. Social studies particularly, that's always a pretty insidious one. English is another heavy hitter. Uh, math and science, not so much, but it'll be in there too. And so you, you have to arm your kids and prepare them to listen out for the trigger words is what I call them. So things like equity, things like intersectionality. These are all terms that you basically need to teach your children that when they hear, basically turn it off. So whatever your, t your teacher is saying in that moment is complete garbage and you need to teach that to them. Uh, so that's how this is gonna be presented in schools. Um, I don't have anything 
any materials to directly show you. I think everyone is kind of aware. If we've seen all kinds of stuff on social media and the news about what this looks like uh, in classrooms. Uh, the other thing is uh, the books, books that are in teachers' um, classrooms and books that are in your in your uh, school library. I encourage every parent to uh, go down to your school and try. Most schools will will show you this. If they won't. Uh, that's a really big red flag. But I actually personally went to my children's school, went to their library, like to the school library, uh, had them look up individual book titles and show that show to me on the school computer uh, in their registry that they did not have those books on the shelves because I don't trust them to be honest. Um, and then go down, you know, go go down to the school unannounced and say, I wish to see my ch my child's homeroom classroom right now right now and take me there immediately. Um, most schools, again, will do this, not all, but if they're giving you pushback, uh, ask them why. Be aggressive, not unruly because you don't wanna get kicked out of your kid's school, but be, be assertive, be very demanding because they are not used to that and they don't, they don't know how to handle that quite, quite so well. So make sure you, you keep that pressure up but go see your kid's classroom. Look at the books that are on the shelves. That'll tell you a whole lot. So that kind of covers everything that most people already know. What I'm gonna to talk to you about specifically is how, if you are not gonna take your kids out of school, out of public school, I highly, highly recommend that if you are in a blue state that you do so. And if you are in a red state, you still consider it or at least evaluate very carefully what the situation is where you are. Uh, now, Gays Against Groomers is not a political organization. The reason why I'm saying this is because the policies that we see in blue states are incredibly pro trans the child, incredibly pro LG, LGBTQ plus curriculum. Um, that, that's why we say that, not because we have any political affiliation with either Democrats or Republicans, that's nothing to do with this. Um, but if you're not, not going to take your kids out of school, and I understand if you can't, I would still advise you, you try your hardest. But if you can't do that, number one things you can do. Number one, get your kids off social media entirely. Any social media app, any anything that allows online chatting, absolutely throw it in the garbage. None of it. You have to get rid of all of that. And that includes games that have online functions. So things that go on, on the Wii, things that go on Nintendo Switch, things that are on the PS4 or the Xbox. Some of these games have online features that allow them to chat, like basically like an internet chat room. And th you, those need to be disabled. You need to take them offline. And if they cry and whine and say, oh, but I wanna do the online player mode, blah, blah, blah. Don't care, sorry, love you. I'm doing this because I know best, parent knows best. And the answer is no. So you have to do that battle with them. But that, that is the mechanism by which this type of ideology is reaching your children. YouTube, Reddit, um, chat rooms, uh, all kinds of things like that. It's a no-go. Uh, so you gotta get them off, off of social media. If possible, get them off of internet entirely. And of course, the last time I said this on a post, people said all kinds of ridiculous things like, well, obviously they need to be tech literate. I'm like, there are ways to teach your children how to use the internet under supervision. That does not mean that you need to give them unfettered access to the internet without your supervision. There is no reason for them to have a smartphone with access to the internet. There's none. Uh, so take it away. The internet is the number one mechanism schools rely on to give your children resources that they cannot themselves advocate for, and they know it. So instead of saying the things that they wish they could tell your students, instead they will say, if you want more information, go here. And they'll list all kinds of things like PFLAG, GLSEN, um, Trevor Project. Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is particularly insidious because they provide chat rooms from t ages 12 to 25. Yep, you heard that right, 12 to 25 is the age range where they actively encourage them to talk about sex, their sexual feelings, their fantasies. I kid you not, this is on their website. Uh, if you are a parent and you are doubting me, you can go make a fake profile on the Trevor space and just pretend 
to be a child how, of however age you want and just listen to the kind of conversations that they have in that space. It is truly horrific. So these are the these are the resources that the school is pushing to your children because they believe that your children will have access to the internet later at home. And most of the time, they are correct. In my household, they would be wrong. My kids have no access to the internet at home, zero. Everything is done under supervision. Another thing that schools will do is they will give your children an iPad. They'll give your kids uh, a Chromebook or a personal laptop for school use. Absolutely confiscate this when they get home. Do not allow them free access on this. If it is a Chromebook or any other device, check the browser history. Most of these school devices have it set so they cannot clear the browser history. Check and see what they're doing. One, this will let you know if they're paying attention in class, uh, my kids included. I've found my kids listening to music on YouTube in the middle of their math lecture. So guess who got grounded? Uh, but also, they can get around these safeguards and they could be looking at all kinds of inappropriate material on their computers. And they will do this at home too if they have the Chromebook or the laptop or the iPad with them. Take it away. So that's a big one. Uh, another thing you can do is put parental guards on all of their devices. So do not go with the free cheapy products. You're gonna actually have to drop some cash. But there are some really great parental control apps that are out there and they will be given to you in links provided by, that I provided to Julie that she will kindly provide to you. Uh, but they're out there, things that will save every single Snapchat um, message if you have teenagers and you don't want to you know, make your life absolutely miserable. Um, but you know, there are other types of parental controls out there that basically clone the phone. Um, look into every poten potential option. You're gonna be paying for this, but it's worth it. It's worth that kind of, um, peace of mind. And then the final thing that you should do is you should get tracking devices. And I kid you not, this sounds absolutely paranoid, but I absolutely mean it. There are tracking devices that basically look like Apple AirTags, but they're not Apple AirTags. And there's reasons why you shouldn't use those, but get them. Uh, get creative where you put them. There are th things that your children that you know cannot run, a run away without, th things that they will always have with them. Get creative with where you put these tags. If they're driving, there are also magnetic um, tags that go and track your vehicle. And regularly check up on your kids. Uh, get, and I say don't use the location device on the phone because kids are smart and they can just turn your phone, their phone to airplane mode and suddenly you can't track them. So the device, though, never turns off. So get these devices, track them. And you might be surprised one day if you look up their location in their lunch period and there happen to be at a health clinic a couple blocks from the school. That might surprise you, but that's exactly the kind of crap schools will do. Here in Washington, they are allowed to take your kids out of school without your knowledge and bring them to a health clinic in order to get an abortion or gender affirming hormones if they are within the right age range. Which is why, like Joy said, it is very important that you make sure that you check with your state you know, your state health care and see if anyone has registered your child for this care, because that is how everyone asks, well, how can they how can they trans your kid without knowing who is paying for it? Well, first of all, you're paying for it. You're the taxpayer. So you're paying for it. And also they can do it to your own kid without your knowledge, because they can go and get health care outside of your own health care. So very important to know there. And the last thing I'm going to say, and this is the hardest one for people to hear and I'm gonna be a little bit more harsh than Joy. Teachers are the enemy for the most part. They need to earn your trust. They have lost all public trust. And if they haven't lost your trust yet, trust me, they'll do something soon where you'll lose their trust. You'll lose their trust in them. Uh, do not trust the school administration. They're not your friend. Do not trust the principals. Don't tr especially do not trust the counselors. Most of them might not even be accredited counselors like Joy said. Planned Parenthood, has clinics in schools in Washington. Now, they're not so brazen as to say Planned Parenthood because that would get people very, very upset, but they are counting on the fact that you are stupid and that you aren't paying attention. And for a long time now, they've been correct. You have not been paying attention. These are why these things matter because then they will give your kids a bunch of pamphlets and instructions on how exactly to go around your back and get the services that you don't want them to have. So do not trust anyone at the school. 
And that doesn't mean you need to teach your children to be antagonistic to teachers, not at all. But you need to teach them not to trust them. Teach your children not to trust their teachers. Teach your children not to talk to school counselors under any circumstances whatsoever. CPS is no joke. They are not your friend. They do not have the best interests of children. Keep in mind that they get paid out of the state or federal budget for how many children are in their care. They have a financial incentive to remove children from parental care because then they get money. Never underestimate that motivation. They are not your friend. If you have looked, if you know anything about the history of CPS, they do not have to immediately or, uh, follow a judge's order. So if a judge orders your child returned to you, I've heard of cases that it's taken over a year after a judge has ordered CPS to release your child that it has not happened yet. This is not a joke. Teach your children that they are not your friend and teach them what the consequences of being too loose-lipped could cost. Yes, that sounds harsh and scary, but these are your children and the state has absolutely every intention, if possible, of doing so. So do not trust your teachers, don't trust the counselors, use your best judgment. There are ways and things to look for. And the last thing I'll say is that you know your kids. They're going to target specific children. They're not going to do this just any child. They're going to look for the child that's a little weird. They're going to look for the child that is on the spectrum. They're going to look for the child that is having maybe some emotional problems. Maybe you have your kid in therapy outside of the school's knowledge and you're taking your kid. They will look for kids with troubles, any type of uh, anything that falls outside of what is very, very stereotypical. They're not going to do this with the best intentions of helping your child. They're going to then start targeting that child. So if you know your child is at risk for this, you need to take extra steps to meet to try to mitigate that the best that you can. But understand that you need to evaluate whether your child is really at risk for this. Highest risks are on the spectrum, autistic. That's number one highest risk factor right there. Second underneath that is your kid is a little awkward, a little weird, maybe a little introverted, doesn't, you know, can't socialize quite as well as other kids. They're going to target the hell out of those kids. They're going to invite them to talk to the counselor at lunchtime, one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely forbid it. All those types of things. Um, it's really important that you understand that the school is actively against you. That is a hard pill to swallow. Most parents don't want to hear it, but that is the truth. And the last thing I'm going to say is that you need to inculcate your kids against the messaging that they're going to hear in the classroom. And the best way to do that is that you need to, if you don't want to talk to them about what transgendered is, if you don't want to talk to them about what gay is, I'm sorry, you should. Because you need to give your family's values to your children so that they have something to stand on and defend against. You want your kids to be defenders of your family's values and not be vulnerable to the nonsense that their teacher is saying. And that means telling them something. So here's an example for you. Let's say that you are a family that does not believe in transgenderism. Okay, fine. Here's a way you might say that in a way that you can arm your child against the things that they're gonna hear from their teacher. A transgendered person is someone, say a boy, who believes and, and, and acts as if he were a girl and so it grounds them in reality without denying the existence of something that is going to be very much in their face they're, you're not going to be able to convince them that trans doesn't exist they're going to see it everywhere uh so you can't that's not going to be the right way to go about it you really need to teach them instead what is and what is not reality that works much much better um and you need to have those conversations of what does non-binary, you know, what does non-binary mean for your family and say it in terms that they can understand and then hold on to in the back of their mind when they're hearing their teacher talk. It's very critical that you have these discussions with your children before their teachers do. 
because if 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 the teachers are the first person to talk to them about this stuff, they're going to believe their teachers over you. You might think you might want to believe that they won't, but they will. You have to have the discussion first. Um, and that doesn't mean you need to tell them that everything is great and everything's wonderful and everything's rainbows, but you do need to give them an understanding of the terms they're going to hear and what your family thinks about these subjects. I'm not saying that, and that doesn't make you homophobic either, by the way, it doesn't make you transphobic. Uh, it means that the reality of which the way in which you see the world is the way that you wish your child to see the world. And you need to convey that to them so that they know what they believe and what their family believes so that they can push back against their teacher when their teacher is overstepping because their teacher will overstep. And on that note, if your kid gets in trouble at school for speaking out or standing up for their beliefs, you need to go to the school and you need to raise hell. You need to let your kid know that you are their number one ally and supporter and that you will have their back, that they will not get in trouble at home if they are suspended, that you will not, they will not get in trouble if they are pushing back these types of topics because teachers will scare your children. They will try to tell them that they are, we literally have teachers that are telling kids that they're bigots and they're, they're hateful. So you need to tell them that you stand with them and that they are, you are on their side, that they can stand up for their beliefs and know that when they go home, you are going to celebrate them, that you are going to applaud them for their brave, bravery, because it takes a lot of bravery to do this. It takes a lot of bravery for a kid who's 12, 13, 14 years old to tell their teacher, who is sometimes more than two decades older than them, that they are wrong and that this is what I believe and I want you to stop. And, and also, let your kids know that they can get up and leave the classroom if they need to on, on these types of discussions. If, if a teacher is forcing the issue about LGBT, LGBTQ cur curriculum and it makes your child uncomfortable, tell them to just get up and leave. Go to the office and call you. Tell them to do that. Uh, and then make sure that you reward them for doing so. But uh, that's all I got. If you guys have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, Gays Against Groomers has a bunch of resources on our website, things like uh, we now have uh, links to resources like uh, non-gender theory uh, therapists that are very useful. We have links to things like gender spec that are great resources. So you check out our website. I will include links to uh, parental control apps and potential GPS tracking devices. There are others on the market. Look, look for what's right for your family, but do consider that. It, it might save your kid's life. So that's all I got. Thank you, Alex. It's impressive how on point you are while you are driving. Like I would be so distracted, but you just, you just roll with it. So that's awesome. Thank you. A lot of information. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, and again, we will be providing you all these links in a follow-up email. Um, all right, without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Jeannie Magdua, who is going to talk to you about critical theory. Hi, Jeannie. Hey there. Oh, I can't share. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Um... Let's see. One moment, everybody. <laughs> One moment. Why can't I? I can't give you. Hey, hey Julie. Yeah. I realized I forgot something and I do want to. Hit okay, you go ahead and talk while I figure this okay. out. I'm so sorry, everyone. I don't have anything written down like I was supposed to because I'm driving. <clears throat> but so another idea that I had with, with Joy, I'm going to give her some credit here, is... Uh, there is a method by which if you're, so if your kid comes to you with these is, and is saying things like, you know, uh, girls can be boys or, um, you know, parroting back this type of gender queer nonsense, right? How might you handle that? How you handle that is very important. Uh, calling them stupid, um, yelling at them, getting angry is not the way to do that. So one of my favorite philosophers is Socrates. 
And he had, it's called the Socratic method. And what you do is you listen very closely to what your child is saying. And so then you go, then you basically propose a situation. You go, okay, well, if this is what you're saying, then is not this also true? And you, you, you present a situation in which, okay, then what about this? And then you basically get them to keep answering these questions until it becomes clear to them that their reasoning is illogical. And, and when they have this epiphany, do not gloat. Do not be a ha. Don't, don't be obnoxious about it. Be very humble because you'd be surprised at how many adults buy into this. So be humble about it. It is not easy for a child to admit that they've bought into something that is logically insane. So be very gentle about that. And also take the time. It's like if, you know, don't dump on them. But as things come up, listen to them talk about their day. If something, if an opportunity comes up to question these types of ideas, do so. Take 10, 20 minutes, talk to your kid. And as soon as they start, like, they've clearly started to digest it, but maybe it's becoming a little much, eh, change the conversation. But keep going back to it, you know, a couple of days later, whatever. Over time, let them come to their, like, they will think about it. They will actually think about the words that you say if you do it in a respectful way. And if instead of ac accusing them, you use the Socratic method of questioning them, having a discussion with question-driven logic. Use their own words. Use their own terminology and, and get them to engage with the question authentically. And they will c eventually come to the conclusion that they are wrong because they have reached an, inf you know, an infallible wall. They'll go, oh, that can't, that can't work. And that, that epiphany will help break that spell that their classroom is trying to put on them better than anything else. I, I've used this with my own kids when they come to me with statements that their teacher has said. And that is exactly the method that we use in my house to get my kids back on track of, oh, that's really dumb. I don't actually believe that. them for their critical thinking. teach them by example how to think critically um, and reach out to me or joy or even julie on how you know you might have those types of discussions um, but it can be done and it should be done okay that's it thanks alex you don't know how amazing you are seriously and anyway okay so um some of some people who are listening to all this might wonder where on earth this is all coming from. And it definitely does have some historical roots. So I'm going to try to start a slide here. Is it going to let me? You guys can hear me, right? Oh gosh. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Something is not allowing me to. Let's try this again. Oh, it's just frozen. There we go. I'm going to try again. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> okay. There. And. And. Ah, ah. Okay. There you are. <laughs> All right. So um, when we try to bring up uh, the topic of critical race theory in public schools, you'll see a lot of people laughing at you or, um, you know, a common argument you'll hear is that it's not taught in public schools. So I just want to show you some examples of that. Here's an NBC headline uh, denying that it's taught in public schools. Um, so it says, yeah, critical uh, teaching critical race theory isn't happening in classrooms, it says. Um, here is the head of the teachers union uh, denying that it's taught in schools. I'll just read this really quick. Let's be clear. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary schools or high schools. It's a method of examination taught in law school and college. Okay, fine. So let's um, let's talk about critical race theory in colleges then. Um, in most law schools, this book, Critical Theory and Introduction, is required reading. The main author, Derek Bell, is considered the pioneer of critical race theory. 
He co-authored this book with other prominent names on the subject. So um, the authors were kind enough to give us a definition of critical race theory right in the first chapter. And it says here, the uh, critical race theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up, but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, context, group and self-interest, and even feelings and the unconscious. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment, rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. So um, in other words, it questions the very foundations of our um, nation's founding, okay? Um, so remember, these are law students in the US that are reading this book and learning this theory. Um, it goes on to say, um, although CRT began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking controversies over curriculum and history and IQ and achievement testing. So you definitely see consequences of that questioning um, in our public schools today. So I'm gonna repeat that one part. Um, they use these ideas to understand issues. So that means that they view these issues through a critical lens theory. Um, Crit or sorry, crit critical theory lens, and it's how they see the world. It's a worldview. Okay, so um, here's another really short excerpt. It says, it also draws from certain European philosophers and theorists, such as Antonio Gramsci. So I just want you to keep that name, Gramsci, in mind. Um, so Gramsci aligned with the philosophy of Karl Marx. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit about Karl Marx. I Every time I read about him, I learn something I didn't know. And so unfortunately, we, we have to talk about him a little bit. So Marx was born to a wealthy Jewish family. And this Jewish family converted to Protestantism so that his fa father could work in the, in the legal field there in Germany. Um, Marx himself, though, rejected God at an early age. Uh, he was purported to be a terrible student. <laughs> um, but he did finally get his PhD in Germany. Marx was also reported to be of mean temper, a racist. He was filthy, like he couldn't even sit down in chairs in his house. He was lazy and drunk, and he had contempt for everyone, even his supporters. Uh, Marx managed to get a writing job with the New York Daily Tri Tribune, but his socialist friend, uh, Friedrich Engels, is believed to have written many of the articles that he submitted to the newspaper, like maybe a third of them. Um, one of Marx's writings was an address to the Central Committee for the Communist League in 1850. And if you read this address, um, you can you can kind of see where Lenin got his instructions for his revolution. It's like a step by step by step instructions. Um, and Marx's friend Engels, who wrote many of the articles for the New York Tri Daily Tribune for him, um, was also the co-author of the Communist Manu Manifesto. Now, the, the point of the manifesto is that capitalism would self-destruct and be replaced by socialism and then eventually communism. Marx's most famous writing, of course, is Das Kapital, or capitalism. Um, many like to summarize this book as a critique of the capitalist system. However, it's much more than that. Uh, Marx believed that man was striving for a socialist society where everyone was equal. His was a philosophy. It, it wasn't just that he didn't like the economic system. It was a philosophy that humans would be at the pinnacle of human consciousness when everyone was equal. But the capitalist system was in the way and needed to be destroyed through revolution. That was his solution, was that there needed to be a revolution. And I just want to emphasize this part that this was actually a humanist philosophy. Uh, Marx was a, um, he was, a, he sought a utopia a godless society. 
Now, um, Karl Marx died in 1883, and those, you know, his followers, communists and socialists, kept waiting for the revolution that Marx predicted. Um, the exploited laborers were supposed to rise up in opposition to the owners of the means of production and take over the economic system. However, that uprising never came. Um, something these communists didn't anticipate was the benefits that these workers were enjoying. Um, goods and services became more accessible and affordable. Uh, standards of living rose across the board. Now, not that things were perfect, and you know, we have child labor laws now because of how things were going, but the workers of the world were now consum consumers. So it was possible to bring communism into feudal societies like Lenin did with Russia, but in capitalist societies, it didn't work. So then we come to the early 1900s and we come to an Italian named Antonio Gramsci, the one I mentioned earlier. Now he was a follower of Marx's teachings. Um, he was a student at the University of Turin in 1913 and he hung out with socialists there. Um, the most influential of his teachers was Antonio Labriola. Um, now this teacher was also a Marxist and he emphasized the development of class consciousness. So just keep that in mind, class consciousness. He taught Gramsci and others that the working class would gain freedom through the process of struggle. So Gramsci didn't finish his studies at the University of Turin, but he rose through the ranks of the socialist organizations. Um, actually, the, the one socialist organization, it was called, uh, sorry, I've lost myself in my notes. Oh, the Third International. Now, another prominent member of this group was Vladimir Lenin himself. Um, this party's aim was to mobilize workers to strike against the capitalist owners of the factories that employed them. So Gramsci was also very critical of Benito Mussolini. And in 1926, Mussolini imprisoned all opposition to his fascist regime, including Gramsci. Um, while he was in, in prison, Gramsci wrote what are now known as the prison notebooks, which were published after Gramsci's death in 1937 or 1938. So he died in prison. Gramsci died in prison, but he wrote these notes that got published later. Um, so his writings emphasized a connection between culture, and this is important, between culture, the state, economy, and power relations. So I'll, I'll summarize just a couple of the points that Gramsci made. First, the um, is that the bourgeois or the upper class maintained their power through cultural hegemony. And hegemony is just a fancy word for dominance. Um, so they were able to maintain this power because they controlled all facets of culture, including religious culture and anything else that promoted belief in their value system. So this means that the, the proletariat or the working class adopted those values, even though it went against their self-interest. So that was his first point. The second point is that to change this system of dominance, the working class needed to develop their own culture based on its own self-interest. And they would do this by forming alliances. I hope this is becoming, you know, this is all so starting to sound familiar. They would do this by forming alliances and compromises with other groups. So these self-interests couldn't be just economic. Um, they had to be moral and spiritual interests as well. So the goal was to develop a cultural counter hegemony or a counter dominance that would rise up in revolution against the, the upper class or the bourgeois. So those were his two main points. So what this means is that human liberation, as Gramsci and those he influenced saw it, would only come through attacking the current culture and value system and replacing it with a new system, one that reflects the interests of the working class, but not just the working class, more broadly, the oppressed. OK, so just, that's um, that was an idea that started coming through with Gramsci. So then we come to the Frankfurt School. Um, the Frankfurt School was founded in 1923 by a man named Karl Grunberg. Grunberg and the other members were Marxists, um, but were also influenced by Gramsci, especially Weber, Freud, and others. So I'm going to mention just two of the members here and highlight a couple of their ideas that have taken hold in today's culture. So Max Hor uh, Horkheimer, um, he began writing about critical theory. Um, uh, Hork Horkheimer made the same arguments about cultural dominance or hegemony as Gramsci did. 
Um, Horkheimer's writings about developing a counter hegemony are obviously influenced by Gramsci. And um, you could just see that he drew from uh, Gramsci's prison notebooks. So that's Horkheimer. Um, he was a Jew and the Frankfurt School is in Germany. So he was the director of the Frankfurt School. And when Hitler took power, um, he named Horkheimer and other members of the school as dissidents. So Horkheimer knew that he was in danger. Um, Horkheimer contacted several universities in the United States, including the Columbia University, which offered hospitality to the members of Frankfurt School. In fact, they had their own building at the university. And so that's um, they continued their studies and their writings at Columbia University during World War II. Um, after the war, uh, the members moved back to Germany and resumed their studies and writings there. But this is where uh, the Frankfurt School's ideas really started to take hold in the United States. Um, Horkheimer's writings are foundational to modern critical theory. So he was the first to define the term critical theory. The bourgeois or the upper class, he says, misrepresent social relations. And their misrepresentation legitimizes capitalist exploitation. This is this is in his writings. He says that Western society is built on domination and technical uh, technological rationality. So if technology um, allows it, then society should embrace it. Is basically what he says is happening in Western society. Um, and he also says that capitalism dampens class consciousness and promotes individualism. Now, for us patriots, we're saying, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. Then, okay, I, I digress. <laughs> so then we come to a conference. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Um, Herbert Marcuse, he's another member of the Frankfurt School. Um, he's known as the guru of the new left. So the old left is FDR. So think in those um, terms. Uh, the, the New Deal and everything. That's the old left. The new left, uh, he is something that he, he is known for beginning. Um, he says that capitalism dehumanizes workers and makes workers into objects. These workers began to view themselves as extensions of the products that they made and developed a consumerist view of the world. Um, so therefore, the workers bought into the capitalist system. Um, he said that social change would only be possible when radical intellectuals, okay, academics, um, partnered with ethnic minorities. So here's where this idea comes into play. So um, academics partnering with ethnic minorities, the unemployed, and here again, that term, the oppressed. Um, he said that students, intellectuals, and what he called the ghetto population were the best prospective substitutes for the working class as agents of revolution. Revolution is still on their mind. It still um, harkens back to Marx. It seems that the only way that they think bettering the human race is to fight. So um, after Marcuse, so that was in 1969 um, that some of these ideas came out. Um, let's see. Uh, just to summarize the Frankfurt School, they aligned themselves with the philosophies of Karl Marx and Gramsci. They believed that workers were not going to rise against the capitalists and new alliances had to be uh, had to be developed. He said that uh, all of these men said that intellectuals, students and the oppressed must band together in revolution against those in power. Um, they criticized Western power structures and believed a new social order must be established. And their ideas spread throughout American academia because they had um, been housed in the Columbia University. But most importantly, their ideas spread through law schools. Okay, so we're going to talk about law schools. Um, we come to the conference at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin in 1977. Um, it was at this conference that a group of lawyers, law students, um, law professors and teachers, they gathered together to discuss the American legal structure. So not just specific laws, but the whole structure itself is what they question. Um, we have to remember the era that this group got together in. So most of these attendees were college students in the 60s, the glorious 60s. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. 
They watched a president resign in shame. Um, they watched the U.S. lose a war. Uh, they lived through an oil crisis and gas miles, uh, you know, gas lines a mile long. Um, they believe they had plenty to criticize about America and Western society. And they all aligned with the ideas of the Frankfurt School and critical theory. So they began a movement called the Critical Legal Studies, or CLS, and they called themselves crits. Um, they were prolific writers, and they critiqued America's legal system as oppressive and that it was structured to benefit only the ruling class. So CLS was very much looked down upon at this time, you know, through the 70s and 80s. It was very much looked down upon by law schools. Um, and in the 80s, a law professor was denied tenure because she identified as a crit. Um, the movement died out after her tenure was denied because they could see that they could lose jobs. However, the ideas that they presented persisted. And there was one prominent crit named Derek Bell, and he is the author of the first book I mentioned, Critical Race Theory and Introduction. So he was a civil rights attorney. He believed that races in America was so embedded and permanent that power structures and the very foundations of our legal system had to change. And he established the critical race theory movement among legal scholars, which had spread to other areas of academia, including teacher programs. Okay, so we're coming for full circle to how this is getting into our public schools. Um, so I just wanna reiterate what was in the first chapter of this book that he wrote. Critical race theory is a um, collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Um, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order. Okay, so what we know as the founding um, ideology of our country, um, they question that and they want to dismantle it. Okay. Um, there's another section in here that says recently critical race theory has splintered, although the new subgroups, which include an emerging Asian American jurisprudence, a forceful Latino critical or lat crit, there's that word again, crit, contingent, and a feisty queer crit interest group continue to maintain relatively good relations under the umbrella of critical race theory. So, um, uh, remember it, earlier writers said that the oppressed, these groups needed to um, compromise and come together and create a new dominance. And we're seeing that today. Um, so the bottom line, oh, I, I also, oh, I forgot about this slide. Um, this is just a summary of each one. Um, I've been asked why I use the term critical theory instead of critical race theory. Um, I've just explained that CRT stems from the critical theory that Horkheimer from the Frankfurt School first defined. Um, the members of the Frankfurt School didn't address legal studies, but American legal scholars took on their ideas and applied it to the foundational theories that our laws are based on. Um, from there, it has branched to other issues. Um, and then now what we're talking about, the bottom line is that critical theory in all its forms is at its core Marxist. So what does that mean? It means that um, one class needs to rise up in opposition, in fact, revolution against those in power. So we see that in women must rise up against men, ethnic minorities must rise up against whites, uh, queer must rise up against what we, you know, what they call us as normies. It's combative. Marxism is combative. It sees the world through a lens of struggle. It drives people to resentment and anger, and it compels its followers to recruit more followers. Um, when I'm told that college level courses aren't taught, uh, you know, critical race theory, um, these college level courses aren't taught in public schools, I usually come back with this response. Um, children in Sunday school aren't learning seminary level lessons, but they all believe in the same God. I want to um, play a short snippet of a speech that Dr. James Lindsay gave at the EU parliament. Um, this is just a few months ago. This is really quick. I'm just gonna play a couple minutes. And so we end up with Western Marxism taking many forms, but with one overarching approach. 
And the approach that they use, I started off by saying, is Maoist, not merely Marxist. Now you know the theory is Marx. It's just evolved into different species to attack the West at its weakest points through our tolerance, through our acceptance, through our openness, through our generosity, through our best traits, actually. The things that we should be proud of being, the things that we are proud of being. But Mao Zedong knew how to use identity politics. I don't know how you study in Europe, but in America, we have very redwashed education, as we might say. The communists have stripped out all education about communism entirely. You don't learn about it in America at all. So we don't learn anything about Mao. And maybe you don't know this, but I tell this to American audiences and they're shocked. Mao used identity politics. He created 10 identities in China, five he labeled red for communist, five he labeled black for fascist. And he categorized people into these identity categories. What they are doesn't really matter. Of course, they were communists. They were things like landlord and rich farmer and things like this. Right winger is a bad category in and of itself, by the way. Conservative, all of them, bad. Bad influences, that's another one. You could be a bad influence for just thinking the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing at any time or because the government decides it doesn't like you. These are the bad categories. And if you have a bad category, very importantly, your children have a bad category by default. So they create a social pressure for your children to identify as revolutionaries, at which point they get a red identity, a communist identity, a good identity, and they get rewarded for it. And the youth read, led the revolution in China because Mao did this, identity politics through the children in the schools. This should feel very uncomfortable to you. And it does. Uh, that's exactly what's happening in our uh, society today. Uh, society today. So there is just one more thing that I wanted to um, mention. Um, I'm a Christian, and as a Christian, I'm really concerned with justice. Um, Christians are supposed to help the oppressed uh, because God is very concerned with justice. Uh, there is a Bible teacher. His name is Vodi Bauckham, um, and I will send Julie a link for you guys to send out. Uh, Vodi Bauckham wrote a book called Fault Lines, and he addresses this issue of biblical justice. Um, so he explains the difference between biblical justice and today's social justice. So if you are a Christian and you, you know, we're supposed to be concerned with being, you know, kind to people, kind to those who are struggling. Um, so we are supposed to you know, deal with this, but we're supposed to deal with, as Christians, we're supposed to deal with this in a way that God um, defines, not in a combative way, the way Marx and Mao have defined. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. That was great. It's a, a dark, a dark history for sure. Uh, well, you have gotten a lot of information already this night. Um, and it probably sounds overwhelming, it sounds scary. Um, and so maybe you're thinking that you, after hearing all this, maybe you're thinking that you could consider homeschooling or you've been wanting to consider homeschooling. Um, and so we're gonna shift our focus and talk a little bit about homeschooling and um, some aspects of that. If you have any questions about um, homeschooling or anything else we've talked about tonight, go ahead and drop those in um, the Q and A, and we will um, we will get to those. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Leslie Williams, who is a master homeschooler and has great information for you. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say master, but thank you. Um, I'm going to actually start out by telling you guys a little bit of the backstory of how and why we started homeschooling in our home. Um, so I have a son that is in college. He's 21 now. Um, starting in kindergarten, public school system, uh, every single year, all the way through high school, I always fought with him to turn in his homework. He got it done. Well, I always made sure he did his work, but he would never turn it in. And I would never find out about the problem until it was too late when when import cards showed up so when i would find out that he's not turning in his homework every morning i would go with him to the school and watch him turn it in and i would look at the teacher and i would say hey 
I'm here to help. If there's a problem, please let me know. Never once did any teacher from kindergarten through graduation of 12th grade did one teacher call me and tell me we're having an issue. Let's, you know, what can we do to work together? We started out um, in Utah. We moved to Washington State when my son was getting ready to start 10th grade. Um, and when we started, uh, we started having these issues in 10th grade, I would show up at the school in the morning and the teachers would start saying, um, you can't come in here. You don't have an appointment, even though it was before school uh, started and I was there to say, hey, I'm here to work with you. They would start not allowing me in. So understanding that the schools and the teachers don't want you there. They don't want you to be involved. That's where I started beginning to understand. Um, while in the high school here in uh, Washington State, um, the, the students were given Chromebooks and that's what they did their work on. And I found out one day when he was here at home that he was connecting to his Chromebook and watching porn on the Chromebooks at school. I went to the school to ask, why are you guys allowing this? And they had the, his access level approved for anything. They didn't cut off anything on, on the Chromebooks for his access level. Um, and so when he would bring the, his Chromebook home, I would take it away. So he wasn't allowed to do that stuff in my home. And then I would start seeing things showing up on our, uh, on our, I don't know, our, our Wi-Fi security system, whatever it is, different IP addresses. And I would start to find out there was other devices connecting to our Wi-Fi. He would be, I would take something away and he would bring home a, a cell phone. Take that away. He got laptops from the school. I take that away. You know, I, things just kept coming in. Um, and then soon found out that he was talking to people on the internet and giving our address away, people that he should not be talking to as a minor. Um, so we were having these major issues. This, the YouTube, um, the Chromebooks um, were used for his schooling in addition to everything else he was doing on it. Um, my daughter, who was in middle school at the time, they would use these Chromebooks to learn. The teachers would say, go to this YouTube channel and learn how to do this math, learn how to do this science. Everything was done on YouTube. And my children would go talk to the teacher and say, "This I don't understand. And they say, watch the video. I don't understand. The video isn't telling me what to do. I don't understand. Well, I can't help you. You have to learn it from the YouTube video. So they were not learning at school. Um, so at my daughter, um, one night we were cutting a recipe and it took 45 minutes till I finally cut it. And I said, what is going on? Why is it taking you so long to cut this recipe? And I looked at the paper she was working on and there was a bunch of circles and doodles all over the page. And I said, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm trying to do the math. It took me 30 seconds and she didn't understand how. It took me only 30 seconds. It was taken forever to figure out this math problem. And that's when me and my husband at that time decided we're done. She's not learning anything in school. The schools are allowing porn <laughs> and pedophiles to get involved with our children. And so I said, that was it. Um, we took my daughter out. My son wanted to stay in the high school. He now has nothing to do with our family because he was being taught otherwise in the school. My daughter, we had to start all over. 
Um, we had to break her of the common core that she was being taught and start all over pre-common core addition, subtraction. And she was just starting 10th grade. She has, we gave her, um, a placement test when we started the homeschooling and she was four years behind. She was just starting 10th grade. So she, we had to start her over at addition and teach her non-common core to get her caught up. And she had to have seven years of schooling in three years to ha let her graduate on time. Um, while she was going through the homeschooling process, she made a video and Julie will give you the link to that, but it's in her own words on, on a Facebook um, video, what she was going through. And it's, it's pretty powerful here at coming from the student, knowing how they're feeling. Um, so you can watch that. Um, so we got her um, caught up um, all seven years. She graduated early, actually. Um, she runs her own business. Um, and so she's very... Um, She's a very well-rounded young lady now. Um, we have been homeschooling now for, well, it's our starting our fourth year. Um, I have three children in the home, five and younger. Um, my five-year-old um, can read, can write. Um, he's uh, spelling. We're just barely starting out on spelling, but he sounds out words and he spells what he sounds um he knows addition subtraction and we have started multiplication five years five years old if we were starting school public school he'd be starting kindergarten this year but we're not doing public school so um our my three-year-old um knows her colors and her letters and we're starting to do sounds now so we're we're starting that process and my uh, two-year-old knows his colors. So, you know, we're we're on the process of all of them on their own on their own way, but they're all projecting the same. Um so when we started homeschooling, we didn't know what to do, and most people don't. It we don't there was the the biggest the biggest thing was me being scared. Am I going to screw up? Am I going to not know how to teach and they're going to fail and they're not going to be good adults and they're not going to be able to go to college or they're whatever. That was the biggest thing was me. But we, we did a lot of research and we started out with a website called the backpack.com. And that website, you can get a full year's worth of curriculum and textbooks um, and teacher's editions of those textbooks pre-common pre core. So you can teach the kids how to do math without taking 45 minutes to do one, one math problem. Um, and it's the stuff that you learned when you were in school, so it's easier for you to teach. Um, we only went through the backpack.com for one year because that got us at least on the, at least how we did it in our home on track to how it's going to, how it was going to work in our home. Um, for my, my younger kids, I use ABC mouse a lot, but do keep an eye on that because you're still connected to the internet and ABC mouse um, can put anything in there that they want your children to learn. So you have to keep an eye on that, but that has helped a lot with, with my kids. Um, we, we do a monthly publication and we teach us history and civics and that has helped here in Washington. You have to have, you have to teach certain curriculum every year. And with us doing that, that covers a lot of them that covers civics that covers history that covers reading that covers um spelling and research and writing um 
and we get our children involved in that so they can do that research and learn that history. Um, so that's kind of big in our home. I obviously not everybody is going to do that because that's our business at home, but you can, you can see that you can combine a lot of things into one thing in your life and that teaches them everything, um, all at the same time. Um, every aspect of our life is homeschool. We don't have to spend all day long, um, like they do at public school, six, seven hours a day. We don't sit around a table and, and say, okay, class, this is what we're going to do today. We don't, um, throughout the day, my kids will come up to me and ask a question. I'll answer the question. And if they're holding a toy, I'll say, what kind of toy is that? What does that start with? What color is that? And that's teaching them. Um, the, my son at, at five years old is, is very curious. And that's a lot of the times that's our science. Mom, how does this work? Mom, what does this mean? And so everything we do in our life is school. And it, it doesn't mean that we're actually sitting and doing school. Um, so homeschooling, I can't teach you and tell you how to do it because it's different for every home. But the biggest thing is just to get, just jump into it, just start it. And it will naturally flow into your, how your home works and it will just start happening. Um, like I said, the biggest thing is being just you being scared and you have to just get past it and it'll work. Um, but that's, I think that's as much as I can get for now. I'm, I'm willing to take some questions, um, from anybody of whatever you want to ask. Anne Marie, do you have, um, you're also a homeschooler. Do you have anything, um, to add to Leslie's? Yeah, totally. So I'm also a special education teacher by trade, career, however you want to call that. And um, and even I was intimidated in the beginning. We started homeschooling in North Carolina as an army family. Um, my daughter was a first grader and my son um, has PTSD from his first four years in China. And um, it, I really, I didn't want to break them, right? I'm like, oh, I don't want them not to be ready to go into the public ed classroom, but it, we just, we weren't at a place where they could be in the classroom at that point. So um I ended up taking a class. And so for those that are in Washington, Washington Homeschoolers Organization is a great resource. Um, you can go on there. They have um, some Zoom sessions. I think they do them like twice a year. Um, and so you can get some background information. You can learn the different philosophies of homeschooling if you want as well. Um, and then Facebook is a great resource, actually. So in Kitsap County, uh, we have Kitsap Homeschoolers. And they are on Facebook and they share lots of information. Parents who are not homeschooling, but are kind of in the shadows trying to decide if this is the jump they want to make are on there. And so I would just search up homeschooling families like in your area, whatever your county is or your state and see if you can find something that way. Um, because we do have lots of questions like what, how, what do we do and what does it look like? And one of my biggest things that I love to tell families is you've been your child's first teacher since the day you met them. So whether, you, you know, you gave birth to them or like me adopted them, you are their teacher. You know them the best. And you did not just teach them Monday through Friday, nine to three for 180 days out of the year. So you didn't say, oh, no, we're not potty training today. It's seven o'clock p.m. or it's Saturday. So we're not doing that. So um, just understanding that all day you're teaching and if you have littles at home you're doing it all day and that's learning and that's how kids learn kids learn through play and exploring just getting in there and and figuring it out um and so for my kids um you know this past year we did um a 
our science was body science. My son has, like I said, PTSD. And so he chose the nervous system, which was really great because he had to learn about all these different things that impact the nervous system and how, you know, this is personal for him. And it really gave him some ownership. He's, he just turned 13 and now he is just so much more aware of how that impacts him. And the year before he did a huge project on Lego and I told him he could pick any toy that he enjoyed and he could do a research project. And so he was reading books. He was looking um, online because we wanted to check out tourism for Lego because that's a big thing. And he wrote one of the best reports I've ever seen for a fifth grader. Um, and his writing improved so much just doing that. And, you know, again, I'm you just meet your kiddos where they are and figure out what they love and go there. Um, so this next year we're doing plant science because my kids love to grow things um, and we're playing around with the idea of farm school. And so let's learn about plant science. Let's learn about the pH and soils. I mean, I need to learn that stuff. So let's learn it together. Um, I'm a single mom. I work full time. I volunteer probably 40 hours a week with Moms for Liberty. Um, and so school doesn't always look like school in my house. We do. Um, I love social studies and I love teaching it and learning it through food and dance and music and art. So guess what? Saturday nights, we're making meals. Um, you know, my kids are researching them. We're trying to figure out how to do these things. What are the recipes? What sounds good? You know, um, we made homemade horchata this year, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, YouTube's got a lot of great videos on there as well. So we were able to um, watch about the sugar skulls and learn more about how that became so prominent in the, the Day of the Dead. And, you know, we watched this really cool uh, YouTube on Los Angeles and how that festival and holiday grew because it really wasn't as popular 30 years ago. And so it was really cool to watch. Um, and my kids are Chinese. So Day of the Dead is very similar to Chinese New Year and how we celebrate our family that has passed. So again, more conversations, you know, that we're having, talking about how things are similar and different. So is homeschooling overwhelming at times? I think every parent who goes and decides to, to take that jump, take that leap, we're all like, Oh, I hope this works out. But what we have to do, and Leslie said it is, we have to unschool ourselves. We have to realize that learning happens all day. Mm -hmm. And if we want our students, our kids to have a love of learning and to always be curious, sometimes that means we have to bring it home and nurture that because it's not nurtured in the classroom. And um, there's many reasons, we've talked about them today, why that's happening. But we want lifelong learners. We want people who are curious. Uh, we want people who ask questions. Um, you know, we know over the last three years, asking questions really hasn't been um, appreciated, but it's been needed. And those of us who have asked the questions, we've been called all kinds of things. And our kids have already seen us do that. And they've watched us be brave. Um, and we did toot Alex's horn a little bit. She homeschooled in her truck during COVID. So, I mean, us moms and dads, we figure this out because we have to, we have to do what's best for our kiddos. So Alex has her hand up, Julie. Yep. I see that. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, um, yes. This is going to be me speaking as a parent and not necessarily as gays against rumors chapter leader. Um, I'm one of those people that never would have homeschooled if it wasn't absolutely necessary for what, you know, we found out my wife and I, that um, our daughters were about three to four years behind um, the national average, which to me was completely unacceptable. And uh, just like Leslie has said, uh, teachers don't communicate any of this to you. Uh, they just hide all of that information uh, and, and give it to other people, but they'll never, they don't really wanna tell the parents this stuff. So when, when that came about, uh, COVID had, you know, school year had ended and COVID was really kicking off. And, um, you know, we had this moment of crisis where we said, we cannot, this can't work. We're, this is not going to work. Um, they're going to fall so far behind and um, we need to do something. And it was really one of those moments where um, if push came to shove, one of us would have changed careers if we had to. Uh, it just so happened that I, you know, was in a position where 
I had a sleeper cab and my my work was very accommodating. And so I brought my kids with me to work and uh, three, three to four days a week um, and had the most stressful, probably one of the most stressful uh, events of my life um, where it was just uh, ridiculous. Um, and my message to parents is that, you know, not everyone is, drawn to homeschooling. It's certainly not an ambition of mine. I am in awe of Leslie and um, Anne Marie for their dedication and how, uh, you know, it appears to be effortless. I've been, I've, you know, been blessed to get to know Anne Marie and it's amazing to see how she just goes about her life with that. And uh, it certainly is not, does not come that easily to me. And I'm sure a lot of other parents could probably feel and empathize with that is like it doesn't it you don't think it's going to come easily to you and maybe it doesn't uh and this is one of those moments where i'll say it's a it's a it's a call to self-sacrifice this is your kid's education this is their future you've had your education you are a parent now this is not about you it's about your kids and so while i probably shaved a year or two off my lifespan my kids now are completely caught up and they now know that they can do a lot more than they thought because I was a, I was a very harsh, strict teacher and I required a lot of my children. <laughs> and uh, we don't, you know, the school does not push your kids anywhere near to the degree that they can be pushed. So even if you do it in a more, I was definitely the more traditional school model. I was like, we're doing this subject and this subject and this subject and this subject. And now for a break, run up and down the length of my truck while we're at the shipper for the next 30 minutes. Go. And so, you know, it was very traditional, but, you know, they will, will rise to the task. If you, if you believe in your kids, if you can bear through it, they will surprise you. And so if you are a parent who is really at that same position where I was, where I was like, I just, there is no other way. We have to get our kids out. We have to fix this. Every every option is on the table for you. If you have to change careers, do it. If you have to make drastic changes to your life, it is worth doing. Uh, and that's all I want to say about that is if you think you can't do it, I promise you can. Yeah. Well, there would be no better teacher than the love of a parent. Uh, you know, you're the teachers at school don't love your kids like you love your kids and if you a parent that loves their child wants what's best for their child a teacher wants what's best for your child as long as they get their paycheck as long as they get their tenure whatever it is they don't love your child like you love your child so i mean that you're the best teacher they could ever have from birth to death <laughs> and you're always a parent past the time they're 18 when they're 35 they have their own family you're still a parent and you're still going to be teaching them at that time mom what do i do my kids are driving me crazy try this you know so you're always a parent um you you're not going to have your the morals that you have in your home that's not going to be taught in school people are people are going to be teaching your children what they believe is right and not what you believe is right and should be taught to your children so above all you should be taking charge of the education of your children just for their well-being above all yeah, that's a that's a great note to end on too, Leslie. That's that's so important, and I hope that um, you know if you have felt like public school was not the place for your child or private school, because a lot of private schools are taking on a lot of these things too. Um, but feeling like you're just not equipped for homeschool, I hope that um, hearing these ladies talk um, tonight um, about homeschooling and that anyone can do it. Um, 
I hope that you will consider that. And uh, if you're watching this on the replay on YouTube, all of the links that we keep talking about that are going to be in the email are actually in the description. So you can find all of the links uh, down below in the description, as well as email addresses for all of our panelists tonight. So if you have a question for Leslie or Joy or any of us um, that have spoken tonight, please do feel free to um, reach out and, and ask those questions. We are happy to answer your questions, um, provide more resources, and, and just help you navigate this process. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we will be bringing you more in-depth information. If you have a topic that you'd like to hear us um, talk about or do a webinar on, please do reach out. You can find more information on our website, conservativeladiesofamerica.com. And there's a contact form there that you can connect with us as well. So until next time, have a good night and thank you for joining us.